If you haven't seen my first film on baseless pots, be sure to watch it before this one. All of the pots in this video have had their bases removed before being planted. It was a fantastic surprise to see just how many people enjoyed the baseless pots video. But it also flagged up that there were a lot of queries that people had and I thought we might as well make a second video just to redress all those problems. Firstly, the most asked question was why use a pot at all? Why not put the plant in the ground? And of course you can do that, but I always like putting them in a pot as well because the pot gives the plant such status and it makes it look much more important. And when you've got an area that you really don't think is very nice, you bring a plant in at eye level so you actually hide that part of the building that you don't like and I tell you it transforms an ugly facade really easily. So I love using big high plants to just redirect the vision so you make everything look so much better. And in a winter when everything's looking a bit drab and you've got a plant that's deciduous with no leaves, at least you've got the colour or the style of the pot that just adds that bit of winter interest. So I love it from that point of view as well. When you've got a small garden and you have a high plant in it, it does make the garden look much, much bigger. I've seen this so many times. So you add several big plants and it sounds absurd, but it really does. It confuses the eye and makes the space grow twice the size at least. We had a lot of comments and queries about what happens if you want to move the plant? Well, obviously the idea of a baseless pot is a plant stays in the pot Ever, pretty much but having said that sometimes you do want to move them over 25 years ago we planted these bay trees in baseless pots the client has asked me back to revamp the area we agreed to add bigger more contemporary pots when Jamie the landscape contractor started lifting them out we realized the pots were partially buried and discovered that the lighting contractor had done this when installing new lights after 25 years the trees are healthy and because they're in baseless pots grown directly into the soil and therefore well watered, they have not developed a taproot that could make them immovable. In the bed behind me, I had a clipped box chicken with a surround of lovely low box hedging. I've decided I find this elevation of the house looks too cut off, too stark, too severe. So I've moved the chicken to a new home. She hadn't been in there long, so she moved pretty easily and I'm putting this lovely multi-stem cork oak there. These do grow remarkably fast and I think they're a wonderful evergreen tree. I like the multi-stem format as they grow. You become more aware of that beautiful textured bark and that's obviously what they peel off in places like Portugal where they produce masses of cork for the wine industry and other things. With climate change, they really are going to be one of the trees of the future, according to Tony Kirkham from Cube. Now this is going to be much bigger, it's quite small now, but the reason I'm putting it in the pot, into the circular box, is because I want it to look bigger and beefier from day one. This will sit higher. I'm basically buying 60 centimetres of plant, and also it's quite nice seeing the multi-stem break from the top of the pot, whereas if I plant it in the ground, I would hide that much and it would look a bit strange, I think. Now always you have to be wary if you put a really big, vigorous tree into a pot. In time it will just grow and burst out of the pot. But because this can be pruned and clipped, we can actually maintain it so it doesn't get too vast. So it won't actually burst the pot, it will just root down through it and I think it'll be fine in that pot for maybe 30, 40 years or more, I'm sure. So bear that in mind. If you're going for a big species, make sure it's something that will tolerate heavy clipping and pruning. Every time the tree puts on lots of growth, the roots grow accordingly, obviously, together. And when you cut back the top growth, the shoots, the roots die back accordingly too. So the tree actually redresses its shoot to root ratio. Okay. First job, as ever, is to remove the base. It's all 
like I'm tipping up. There we are. And just pull it forward a wee bit. Right, shall I go and call Kev? We'll be of use, won't I? No? Well, the cork oak is finally in place. Now, if the cork oak had been going into softer ground where it hadn't had a pot before, I think I would have chopped it up with maybe four bricks around the edge just to make sure it didn't settle unevenly. But as it is, it's fine because that is fairly compacted there. If it was maybe a standard with a big heavy top, a thin stem, and it was in a very windy position, I would then get a metal bar, something like a road pin, and I would just run it straight through the root ball into the ground below to make sure that the wind didn't knock it over. Although it looks quite small and insignificant now, in about three or five years it will really motor on. They are very fast to establish and grow on in my experience. Even the two by the drive have grown on amazingly. It's a nice little tree and I'm really looking forward to seeing it develop and grow on. Of course, if you do want to move your plant in a pot, or you think you will need to in a few years' time, there is a very good solution. And that is these root control bags, Rootex root control bags. And they're magic because they're actually coated on the inside with a copper solution. And so you're, you put the plant into this root control bag with soil all around it, and then you sink it into the ground. And what happens is when the roots go towards the edge of the bag, they actually become more fibrous and the point stops growing because the copper repels the root tip. So you only get very small thin roots coming through this fabric, which means you can keep the plant in the ground so you don't have to water it so frequently, but you're not gonna get massive tap roots coming through it. And I think this is a great solution for a number of plants. First of all, for my Christmas tree. This lovely little pine tree, when I've used it this Christmas in the house, I'm gonna plant it into this root control bag. I'll sink it in a hole in the ground and it will go on very happily in my garden. And it means that when I come to next Christmas, there won't be any big tap roots going through into the ground. I can easily lift it up and put it into its pot keeping it in the root control bag if I want to. And yet it will still keep growing. So maybe in 20 years time, I'll have a massive, lovely, big, bushy Christmas tree and I'll prune it as well. So I'll make it that perfect Christmas tree shape, just like you see on Christmas cards. The other thing that these root control bags are good for is if you've got fig plants. Everyone knows if you put a fig in the ground, it grows into a massive giant, produce lots of leafy vegetative growth and not as many figs as you would like. But by restricting the root system with one of these bags, you're doing that without having to root prune it or whatever. On allotments, they don't really like you putting trees on allotment, fruit trees and things like that, because they, their roots spread out into other allotment sites. So it's a good thing for that too, these Rutex bags. So that's the solution. If you are going to move your plant in a pot or you're thinking of moving house in five years time, maybe you put them in one of these root control bags in a baseless pot or in the ground and then you can move it whenever you like. have one or two criticisms or comments about the cost of the terracotta pots but of course there's so many different types of pots you can use probably the least expensive are the plastic pots and you can buy sort of slightly shaped plastic pots like the one we've got here and if you don't like the color or it doesn't fit in with your color scheme then you can spray it and I think the car paint sprays are one really good way to go and you can get quite good lead colors with sort of gray galvanized colors the aerosol spray and you can just quickly spray them on and they seem to last forever. If you want to have a stone finish then you can use a masonry paint and if it's a smooth masonry paint but you just add in a bit of sand and mix it into the paint then you get a slightly textured surface when you paint it on but you must choose the shape of the pot to correspond with the type of pot so you wouldn't have a stone pot in a very elaborate shape perhaps so that might look unconvincing so if you're going to go for a stone color go for a pot that would be shaped 
as it would be if it were stone. Other ones we've done are woven oak and these are really nice and they're quite easy to weave around and then if you want to splash out a bit you can just have a dressed lead coping on the top so get a bit of code 4 lead and just wrap it around the top rim and that is also where it's going to get the most weathering from the rain and the water and the snow so lead actually protects that coping and makes it last longer. Timber pots, we've used so many different timber pots and if you haven't got a lot of money you could use a tunnelized softwood so it'd be much cheaper than say a durable hardwood like cedar or oak which would be far more expensive and don't forget because you're putting a plastic lining whether it's a heavy duty black polythene or a rigid lining then it's going to be really well protected on the inside which is where most of the moisture is so it will last a pretty long time and timber can be so many different styles and we've done many different ones with finials if you want to be smart contemporary and simple if you want to be much more modern metal I love and galvanized metal obviously won't rust and then you can apply a paint finish if you want um, or you can do the acid etched finish which makes it like lead the simplest ones are the round drums um, and these are much less expensive and I get my metal worker to make them up for me we put rivets around the top and bottom usually or wherever we want the rivets and that adds a bit more style but if you want to be more contemporary then perhaps you leave those off Terracotta is always popular because it fits in with so many gardens and you can get so many different styles. But do make sure it is frost proof, not just frost resistant. And the Terracotta Pot Company manufacture pots with a 50 year guarantee. Guaranteed to minus 20 degrees C. So that is pretty good. We don't, well, I've never got below minus 20 degrees C here. And what's more, they actually spray the outside with a repellent that stops water being absorbed into the terracotta. And you can actually buy it, this spray now, and you can spray it on the inside of the pot. And it's called Terracotta Pot Guard. And I think that's probably worth doing. For a few pence, you're just prolonging the life of the pot. Probably the top of the range are lead. Lead is a fantastic material. It develops a wonderful patina and you can form it into any shape at all. And if you haven't got the budget for lead, then of course you can always get some code four lead, which comes on a roll, and you can clad it round maybe a plywood structure or something like that. And that's a pretty good option. I got a plastic water butt or a plastic drum and I just wrapped the lead around it. And that is dressing it with lead as they call it. Well, I hope that's cleared up some of your queries, but I'm sure we'll get loads more comments coming in and do keep them rolling in. We like to hear from you and please do subscribe to my channel.